My name is Jan Neutze. I lead the Defending Democracy program at Microsoft, and I'm very grateful to the Sufan Center and all the organizers for uh, including me in the conference, which I think um, addresses an incredibly important topic. Uh, and what I would like to do today is uh, to uh, give you uh, a sense of the evolving uh, threat landscape um, as well as some of the things that we have been doing from a Microsoft perspective as well as in partnerships with, with many others to tackle the challenges both as they relate to disinformation as well as the broader challenge of nation state uh, hacking of uh, electoral and uh, democratic processes. I think what we heard this morning um, is uh, important for um, for, for, for a variety of reasons when it comes to understanding disinformation. People who propagate disinformation do so for a range of motivations, um, from exacerbating existing societal fault lines to ultimately creating and sowing uh, conflict and ultimately chaos and potentially violence. And so these are huge challenges that um, have in many ways been tactics that governments and others have used for a long time, but frankly the hyper-connected and hyper-scale of today's information and communication technology companies as well as social media companies has led us to a scenario where these tactics, uh, frankly, are now posing an asymmetric threat. When you think about it for a moment, technology companies weren't ever built to withstand military-grade assaults on their infrastructure, just like they weren't built to withstand physical military-grade assaults on their infrastructure. And yet, that is exactly the world that we live in. And so all of us need to act both individually and collectively to help defend against these challenges. One of the things I'll just say uh, before I get into the, into the presentation, at Microsoft, we believe that the technology industry in fact, has the first responsibility to address these challenges. It's really up to us to make sure that we can defend and protect our customers um, against all these threats that are emanating um, in the digital space. But the reality also is there are things that we can do, but there are many more things that we can and should do together in partnership. And so what we need are much more effective uh, coalitions of sort of multi-stakeholder engagement in tackling these threats. I'll use the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, really to do two things, as I mentioned. One, I'd like to ground us um, in an understanding of um, the threat landscape as it presents itself today. Um, and so uh, I'll start uh, by giving you a quick overview as a sort of context setting uh, for what we've been tracking when it comes to nation state cyber attacks, as well as then moving on to the disinformation side of things. And then I'll finish by highlighting a few things that we've been involved in from a, from a Microsoft perspective as well as in partnership with others. This is an overview over the last decade plus, and I can just say what a decade it has been. Um, when you start thinking back um, to the uh, far less sophisticated attacks that we saw against Estonia in 2007 and how far we've come uh, where now adversaries are leveraging the latest technologies uh, such as AI and, and other uh, ways of machine learning um, which we'll talk about just in a, in a second, um, the, the trajectory is hugely concerning. Uh, and clearly, again, electoral processes and democratic institutions have moved up on the target list, uh, and there, are, uh, a there is a continued stream, really, of attacks targeting uh, these uh, entities. Just about a week ago, 10 days ago, actually, we uh, released a, a, a report or a blog post that details um, what one particular um, nation-state uh, actor has been doing in this space, and that has been uh, widely reported upon. Uh, but I wanted to highlight it here because it demonstrates, again, the continued nature of this threat. It's not something that sort of started in the U.S. in 2016 and, 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 and ended then. In fact, it started much earlier than that, uh, and, and it, it, it will continue, I think that's safe to say, uh, for many, many years to come. Uh, the other part, then, that's important to be aware of is that as we uh, think about um, the increasing proliferation of foreign influence campaigns, which in many ways make this threat a hybrid threat that's no longer just focused on 
uh, hacking and leaking documents to her political campaigns, but to then also engage in a sophisticated influence operation. I'll, I'll point you to a couple of reports that I find incredibly useful in that, in that context, starting with um, the Canadian Communication Security Establishment, which uh, in um, April of this year, I believe, released a report that, based on their analysis, details that this is a challenge that has not only affected one or two countries, but in fact that over the past decade, more than 40 countries had their electoral processes, uh, their elections, and their political um, establishment targeted through cyber means. Another report, which I think is probably the, the, one of the most authoritative I have seen on foreign influence campaigns, was issued this summer by Princeton University. And that report has a couple of interesting data points. I'll just quickly talk through them. One, Russia, by far and away, according to their research, um, is the actor that is responsible for the vast majority uh, of foreign influence campaigns. I think they have that number at somewhere around 70%, uh, followed by uh, three other countries, uh, namely Iran, Saudi Arabia, and China. Uh, and it details uh, in a really interesting way uh, how these campaigns are targeting oftentimes not just a political uh, a party or, or, or a, a candidate running for office, uh, but how they are spreading uh, these, these efforts um, in, in, in many ways to directly target uh, populations on, de on divisive issues. And so that's a, it's a fantastic report. The last thing I'll just say, just last week, the United States Senate Intelligence Committee, of course, released uh, the second volume of their report on, on Russian foreign interference um, in the U.S. elections. Again, also something I would encourage everyone to, to read. The other thing that I think is important when we talk about disinformation at this conference and around the world is to try and, again, ground ourselves in um, how to scope that problem. And I think uh, this, uh, this um, overview or this framework here is, is from a Council of Europe study that was published last year, and it tries to sort of divide things into, into three broad buckets. One, misinformation, um, which um, in, in, in many... Um, instances is described as unintentional mistakes uh, where no real harm is meant, um, information that's published without uh, in, uh, trying to create harm, but it's nonetheless false. Disinformation then, uh, where information is published to create harm, and then malinformation um, where uh, you, you, you similarly to disinformation, this is sort of overlaps, where you actually take uh, t technically correct um, information and, 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 and falsify it. And so uh, this framework, I think, is something to keep in mind when we try to segment uh, how we approach misinformation, disinformation, and, and, and other types. Because ultimately, when we craft responses, both technical and policy, it is important, I think, to, to, to keep in mind uh, both the intent and the, um, the, uh, the approaches here. One specific subcomponent component of disinformation, then, is something that I think you'll hear a lot about over the next two days. And I wanted to uh, talk about it a little bit today. And that is un the un understanding um, the, the, the context, really, and the danger that's posed by something that's called deep fakes. Um, what, what are deep fakes? Very basically, uh, photo editing, video editing, or audio editing, and then you apply machine learning to that. Uh, uh, the, um, well, there we go. <laughs> the, um, it's, it's incredibly interesting to see how this technology has evolved rapidly uh, in the last few uh, months, in the last couple of years alone. And the challenge when it comes to deep fakes really is that uh, we are in many ways in sort of an arms race, where the creation of deep fakes using these editing tools and applying machine learning or deep learning to it um, far outpaces at the moment the ability to reliably detect uh, what constitutes a deep fake. Uh, or otherwise uh, known as synthetic media. And I wanted to just share an example that many of you might have already seen, um, but let's, um, let's let the video play. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place. You see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. 
Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the Internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. Well said, and I think it exemplifies sort of what we're talking about when we talk about deep fakes. And let's keep in mind, this is an early version of what uh, folks would call a deep fake. Technology is only going to get better, and detection um, still is going to be incredibly challenging just because of the way that the deep learning um, uh, uh, algorithms actually, actually work. The other thing then just to keep in mind is that the impact of deep fakes as well as disinformation broadly um, really are, um, are, are challenging not just for, for governments um, but also there's an example of a, of a failed military coup in Gabon um, or end of last year, earlier this year, um, which was in part based on this debate on whether there was um, a, a potential deep fake video as part of her presidential uh, address. But they also, and it was briefly mentioned earlier, impact organizations uh, in terms of um, brand safety, um, and, and, uh, and of course they also impact individuals at the very personal level, sometimes with uh, things like fake pornography and, and, and other items. There should be another brief video here. Imagine this for a second. One man with total control of billions of people's stolen data, all their secrets, their lives, their futures. I owe it all to Spectre. Spectre showed me that whoever controls the data controls the future. All right, let's be clear. He never actually said that. Um, but it is uh, something that, again, based on, on these technologies is possible. I wanted to move forward then and talk just for a moment about what we've been doing from a Microsoft perspective, um, as well as how we try to partner with, with others to, to address some of these threats. Um, about a year and a half ago, we launched our Defending Democracy program with three core uh, components. One, to work on protecting political campaigns around the world. Uh, two, to safeguard elections and apply technology in a way that we do that. And then three, uh, the focus of today's topic, uh, defending against disinformation. Um, something that we launched uh, early on um, is, uh, goes back to what I said at the beginning, uh, with regard to the threat of nation-state attacks against campaigns, where they, where they hack entities, government or, or political entities, and then leak these documents. Um, and so we launched a service called Account Guard, which leverages our uh, high-end uh, cyber threat intelligence, which is focused on detecting uh, nation-state activity against our customers and then notifying uh, these customers of these threats. Um, we typically provide these capabilities to uh, enterprises and to, uh, and to uh, uh, large customers. The challenge that we have, I talked about this asymmetry, is that political campaigns or think tanks, other organizations that don't have large IT staff, in no way can defend themselves against a military-grade assault. And so Account Guard is trying to solve some of that by, by making these technologies available uh, for free uh, for political stakeholders. Building on that then very briefly, uh, we also um, uh, got, uh, I think, a lot of feedback from, from these types of customers that really describe to us that they don't not only have large IT staff, but oftentimes products that the technology industry puts out there just tend to be too complex and too complicated. And so how can you then protect yourselves making use of high-end capabilities if you really have very limited capability to set up and, uh, and, and configure the systems that you need to do? And so what, what, what this does, uh, what we've specifically tailored for campaigns, Microsoft 365 for campaigns, um, again, takes our high-end security capabilities and deploys them uh, in an automated fashion where you don't need to be an IT expert. It's really about usability and, and empowering um, those, those, uh, those, those customers to be able to benefit from these technologies without a lot of effort. Um, and then finally, something I'll say with regard to um, elections and election technology, a big uh, topic of discussion currently in the United States, but also many other countries that use com voting technology uh, in, in some shape or form. What we've tried to do here is, um, in, in the context of a project we call Election Guard, is something we're very excited about, and that is uh, using uh, advanced encryption technology uh, to help secure the voting process. And the way this works is that when a voter goes into the voting booth and, and uses some sort of technology to cast their vote, they not only cast their vote and drop a ballot at the end of the day in some ballot box, they also receive a tracking ID, which is based on this encryption. It's called homomorphic encryption. And that tracking ID, think about it like a UPS or FedEx tracker, is something that you keep 
and then you can go to a publicly available website where you can verify that your vote has in fact been counted and included um, in the tally. At no stage in time is the vote in any way made public. The votes are anonymized and encrypted. Um, and so this really is something that ultimately would enable what's called end-to-end -end verifiability. And it democratizes the ability for voters, uh, other organizations, parties, media organizations to verify that the vote has not been tampered with. And so we, again, developed this, made it available for free. We open sourced it. And we're working with a lot of different folks in the community in the US, as well as around the world, to try and deploy it. And then finally, coming back to what I said earlier about uh, the challenge of deepfakes or the threat of deepfakes, something that I think many of us are very concerned about, even though we haven't seen it be deployed um, necessarily at, uh, at great scale um, in, in, the, in the political um, uh, contest or context. Um, but that is not to say that that couldn't happen. And so we partnered actually with, uh, with Facebook and with a, a, a group of other countries through something called the Partnership for Artificial Intelligence uh, on a deepfake detection challenge where there's going to be research and training data made available uh, so that researchers can then take that data and essentially write detection methods uh, on that data. It uh, is something we're excited about because it really tries to go beyond the expertise that's uh, within, our, within our companies. There are many other things that many of us are working on, um, but this is really trying to sort of have a more of a community effort in, in stemming, stemming the challenge of deepfakes. And then finally, I'll just say uh, one more thing about uh, what we're doing with regards to disinformation. Um, it is a, a, a partnership that we've been quite excited about uh, with a, a company called NewsGuard Technologies. What NewsGuard does um, NewsGuard does not try to censor content. NewsGuard rates news websites. And they do that with a red or a green label based on nine principles of journalistic integrity. Uh, and so they uh, then develop these labels and they, and they also develop what, what they call a, a nutrition label that gives the user a lot more context when, they, when, when you go to a website and look for, for a news article. You'll see a red or a green rating and then you can kind of figure out why is this website rated red or green. Uh, it's, it's something that is uh, incredibly easy to deploy. Uh, it's available for all platforms and all browsers. Um, and if you haven't uh, seen it before, I'd encourage you to, uh, to take a look. Because ultimately, what this is trying to do is to bring more transparency into the news uh, 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 environment and, and really try to boost media literacy, which I think is a core component of what we need to do uh, to try and address the challenge of disinformation. So those are a few things that we're engaged in. Um, I will just say, as a quick demonstration of how NewsGuard works with the fake uh, Maryland News website, um, I will just end uh, on sharing three observations, and that is one, I think we need to really start thinking outside the box when it comes to uh, innovation in how we protect our electoral processes, uh, our societies more broadly, and we need to try and do that by harnessing the power of technology to not leave that power to those who are trying to undermine and exploit that technology. Two, I said it at the beginning, and I think it's a critical point, we can't do all of these things in just our own individual capacities. We have to work together, and that is industry working more closely with governments. It is industry partnering in better ways, more effective ways with others in industry. And there's a huge ecosystem of researchers and, and, and academics out there that, that have a, a lot of expertise in this field as well. So really getting to this new level of multi-stakeholder collaboration is critical. And then lastly, deepfakes is a perfect example of how we can't only look backward to see what happened, say, in 2016 um, or, or, or in other contexts. We really need to start thinking about and get better at anticipating how these threats continue to evolve. So that's uh, one industry perspective. I think there are a lot of fantastic uh, speakers that I'm sure will pick up on some of these themes. Thank you very much for having me here, and I wish you a wonderful conference. Thank you.